Hej allihopa. Hörs jag bra? It's a great pleasure to introduce Sofie Oxenen, a dear guest for us all here in Gothenburg and in, in, in the Swedish reading circles. Uh, Sofie, welcome back to Göteborg. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Stefan, and very nice to see so many readers and book lovers here. I know that Sophie has a heavy program, so we'll try to uh, keep the questions sharp uh, and keep this conversation alive. And there's a lot of things that I'd like to ask you, but I'll, I'll start with one thought. I know that hair is a very striking part of your appearance, and I think most polite people and most sensitive people have avoided asking you questions about hair because that would be obviously so strange for a writer who's writing fascinating novels to dwell on on something but that I is so you, you know stefan no, now i'm afraid you think too beautifully about people because uh i uh i've had a conversation with the chimamanda gnocchi adichi about the hair issues and what kind of questions the hair authors, because she's a hair author as well, get, and there, uh, there are quite a lot of them. So you get a lot of questions about your yes, hair? Yes, but in a way it's, it, it's okay, and I also uh, give a lot of tips where to find a good hairdresser, things like that. Because, I, <laughs> because I've been thinking that when you've written uh, books that are read around the world about difficult issues of occupation, war, migration, uh, and then a beautiful book about um, living with, with personalities that are not always adaptable and functionable in today's Helsinki. Uh, and then you have to do something else. And then you write a book which sort of makes you a hair writer even more. Why, why this, I mean, where did the subject come from? Well, I, I've always had an interest uh, for hair, uh, for the cultural history of hair, the mythologies related to hair, um, art history, um, and um, beauty politics in general. So in that way, those, uh, those themes have been in my interest always. Uh, but the story itself started uh, or came, let's say, let's say it like that, uh, it came to me uh, somehow, but out of the blue, um, because I was just going to write a short story, um, a postmodern version of Rapunzel. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I noticed that I had a first version of the novel. Uh, so in that way, I wasn't planning to write the story, but uh, I think I've always had the story in me. You know, I, I think it was Donna Tart who said that every author has uh, five or six stories in them. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, we cannot know when they come out, but that's the number of the stories you have in, in you. I'm not, I'm not sure about the number, exact number, but uh, I think the idea is that you have the stories anyway inside you. It just might take time to be able to formulate them or to put them on the paper, but in a way the, all of the stories are stories that are already in you. It's interesting that you men mentioned Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie because in her novel Americana, a hair salon also plays a, a large role, although this is not what the book is about. And this is a bit how I feel about the role of hair in your novel. Because it's, as I see, it's very much a novel about the same thing. Different generation of women and their uh, relationships and things that are traded between generations of women. So in one sense, it's very much the same topic that you always write about. But I, but I couldn't stop thinking that you just had a lot of knowledge about this because you use hair extensions and you started wondering where these hair extensions come from. 
But I'm using fiber, so I haven't ever had actually uh, human hair extensions. But uh, I mean, uh, I have to say that 20 years ago, when I got my first uh, hair extensions, I wasn't thinking about the ethical side as such. Um, but I mean, human hair is more expensive, and I was a poor student, so in a yeah, way, yeah. of course, I go for, go for fibers. Um, but um, but I uh, I mean, even though I've been interested in hair industry for a long time, then it I still uh, was surprised of some of the things uh, that I that I found out when while uh, writing Norma, uh, and uh, and also I mean I did knew that uh, hair industry uh, hair extension industry is a huge business, but I didn't know how huge. Also, so. Should we start by introducing the character of Norma for those who haven't read the book? Uh, who is she? She's a, she's a girl, she possesses certain supernatural features linked to her sense of smell. How more would, how else would you describe Norma? Uh, well, she's a special character, but she's a, like a modern day Rapunzel in a way that she has an unusual hair growth. Um, and... Um, yeah, well, that, that's about it. I mean, I don't want to give too many spoilers as well. She has unusual uh, hair growth, and she's the daughter uh, of another person who's called Anita and whose life has been very much determined by Norma's special features. But it's also, like I said before, it's, it's like most of your novels. It's about different generation of women in the same family where certain things are passed on from generation to generation. And um, would you say something, I mean, without spoiling the novel, could you say something about this intergenerational relationship between women? Yeah, um, well, before, in, in my previous novels, I have studied um, how psychological traumas and wounds, how they pass on to the future generations. And uh, now I, I think I'm more there's something very important happening there <laughs> but let's let's try to get focused uh, um, but in Norma I'm studying the um, biological inheritance and uh, in that way it's well it, those are the two different sides of the inheritance psychological and, and biological but in Norma, uh, it also creates fear because people are afraid of the biological uh, biological features they might uh, get, um, and that again leads to another theme in the book, and that is the um, surrogacy business. Because the the story linked to the trade with human hair for hair extensions in salons in the West, where different type of hair from different type of women uh, is valued in different ways and has different prizes but it also creates an industry and an industry that is looking for new source countries new countries where you can grow human hair for trade and in this plot there is a link to surrogacy so it's two ways of using the female body as a sort of industry or plantation for the need of people in wealthier societies and one thing that struck me when I read it is that this discrepancy between the wealthy and uh, the less fortunate in the world is usually discussed when it comes to sex trade and that the interesting thing with your book is that it, that it covers all other parts of the female body except the sex trade. Was this a conscious choice from your side? Oh, oh well, yes. Um, well, I, I have written about sex trade before, and uh, and uh, well, it's obviously the most known uh, human trade field. Uh, but there are also many other forms of slavery as such, but also many other forms of uh, trafficking. And if you might think that hair trafficking sounds like something that, that doesn't exist, but it, it does exist. And, and, and also the surrogacy, which uh, 
which uh, which was again something I didn't know much about before starting uh, starting to write the story. Um, but I, I I had the feeling that this is actually something I have to include to the story because already because the Rapunzel and the fairy tale and actually all uh, fairy tales are also fertility tra uh, fertility uh, tales. And in that way, it was logically in, in the story already, but uh, the also the surrogacy of tourism or, or trafficking and hair industry or hair smuggling, they have one common feature in addition to the fact that it, it involves women, young women, but also that there's no common understanding or international understanding what are the rules and in those both of them they have why they are so um, lucrative um, is based on on the technology I mean technological development has been really like you know on the first line uh, but that's the reason why we don't have regulation we don't have international ethical understanding what are the rules I was just going to ask you about this because of course Norma is a novel it's not a political pamphlet it's not it's not what we in Swedish call debat book uh, which is meant to give one moral point of view on this but you as a person when you've researched the topic is there something you would like to share with us when it comes to the issue of surrogacy and how it looks from a global perspective if you include this this inequal global inequality into this? Uh, yes, well, for example, in, in a book there's a, a, a mentioned a Japanese businessman. And uh, that uh, character is based on a real figure. Okay. Um, there was this 23-year-old uh, Japanese man who, was, uh, who wanted to become a father, or that's what he told at the surrogacy clinics. And uh, he uh, and it took like few years before uh, uh, Interpol uh, gave, gave a warrant about him because he had been in different countries in different surrogacy clinics. Uh, he had fathered over 10 t 20 children in few years. Uh, some of, yes, over 20, and now we are thinking about a, p a boy who is himself a little bit over 20. Yeah. So in a way, it's not like, I don't think a 20-year-old boy actually wants to have a family of 20 children. I mean, really. So in a way, uh, and at the moment, uh, some of the kids are missing. He had a uh, huge residence for the surrogates. So in a way, they were kept there. And then they had uh, another flat for the babies. Uh, but some of the kids are missing, so in a way we have no idea wh where they are. Uh, where he got the money from is that he came from the rich family. So um, in, in that way, this is also possible at the moment. And then also in the book, there's mentioned another case um, about an Australian um, pedophile who also uh, got, um, got a child through surrogacy. And uh, that is totally okay, no matter wh what, his what his criminal records are. And uh, yeah, that would have been everything, uh, the only reason why he was caught and actually uh, why it was considered just uh, investigated was that his sister rang the clinic and said through the clinic that you cannot give this person a child. So in a way, there are a lot of... Uh, possibilities to really nasty incidents and anyway the kids who are born they are anyone I mean they are innocent to what's happening but we don't even know what's gonna happen to them but those are two very extreme cases that I understand that you as a writer become fascinated by because they're stories that put everything that we we think about in this case to, to the test but when you were researching surrogacy as a global phenomenon and, and you would see it from the perspective of, say, a, a childless couple that really have good intentions, but if we still look at it as an industry, is there something you would like to say about this situation? Uh, well, for example, uh, the legal system is so different in different countries. 
Uh, for example, in some countries, uh, gay men uh, and gay couples are welcomed, and in most of them not, but in some, yes. And in some, for example, gay couples as such are welcomed, but then again, uh, uh, you have to, uh, you ca both of them cannot be like, you know, intended parents, but only, only the other one. Uh, this is something that uh, differs from country to country. Um, and when I think about, you know, those intended parents, then actually, you know, I'm not thinking about only the um, safety of the child, but also those who want to have the child, because uh, they are ending up a very strange uh, international uh, maze of rules that actually might not be valid in your country or might be. We don't actually know at the moment. So in that way, y you might end up in a situation where uh, your child, even though you think everything is okay, might be also actually taken from you. And uh, in Italy, there was, a, there was a couple who had got uh, twins, I think, through surrogacy, but because in Italy it's illegal. So the kids were taken away from them, yeah. and but the problem was that because they had got the children from uh, uh, pr through uh, Ukrainian surrogacy, and in Ukraine you don't have to, uh, the surrogate mother's name is not in the birth certificate. So that meant that they couldn't, uh, the court couldn't uh, return the baby to the person who had bore them. So the baby becomes stateless. Yes, in yeah, a way, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in this strange limbo, and they, those kids ended up uh, at the orphanage, mm -hmm. even though they did have someone who had given them a birth, and they did have actually, you know, the parents. And, and this is a this is very, very strange uh, situation that uh, um, I think it's worth to, to talk about it. How do you feel as a, as a writer that's become the, the voice, whether you liked it or not, you've become the voice of Estonian history in most of the readers around the world uh, from their point of view, because I don't think a lot of people outside of Northern Europe know a lot about Estonian history, and they know about it through your books, and you've become sort of Miss Estonia a little bit with some of these readers. How do you feel leaving this topic as a writer and going into something completely different? Is it a relief? Well, it, it, it was fun. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll be back to uh, Estonian history uh, as well. But it, w it was fun to do something I didn't know I wanted to do. So in, in that way, for, uh, for my development as, as an author, I think it was very important to do something you didn't, you, you were not expecting even yourself that you are going to do. I like it a lot, but then I would like to venture a little bit back to the situation because uh, a week or two weeks back, uh, a speech that you gave was printed in Expressen as an article. I don't know if you read about it. It was... Um, very interesting. I, I recommend you to read it. I don't remember the, um, the title of it, but you can go back to the archive of Express and Culture and search for Sophie Oksanen and you will find it. And it was a text about the refugee situation today, but also about your own experience of uh, migration and, and refugees from Estonia. And there was something very, I mean, you start with this prejudice that we see all around Europe about the teenage boys that arrive from Syria and from other parts of uh, the Middle East and Africa today. And would you like to say something again about this situation? Because there's a lot of prejudice linked to why are these teenage boys coming? And there's a lot of threats surrounding them and mythology surrounding these boys. Uh, yes, uh, one of my family members um, uh, from Estonia who fled to the West, or actually he was the only one who fled to the West. Uh, he had just turned 18, and first he fled to uh, Finland, and uh, then from Finland to Sweden. Uh, the ship went down, but he was a young man, just turned 18, so he made it to the shore, but he didn't know if anyone else had made it. So this is the reason why I wouldn't send, you know, children 
perhaps young boys because they they will be the ones who are, who will be needed for the enemy army and why it was so important that we get this particular boy out of the country was that because there had been you know soviet army german army german army wanted him and as you can imagine estonians don't want to go to fight for german or soviet war they want to keep fight their defend their own country but that wasn't possible so there were a lot of uh, estonian young men who went to forest who left the country uh, some of them went uh, uh, d during the winter war they went to uh, war wage war with the finns uh, against soviet union uh, so in a way it's um, but we chose to uh, send this one young man because also because we didn't have more money Fleeing is always expensive. Uh, it's really expensive. So in that way, you have to make choices. You have to choose who will be the one who will be actually under threat the most. And Finland, I mean, right now, Sweden went from being one of the most generous countries when it comes to uh, accepting refugees to being one of the least generous countries in Europe when it comes to accepting refugees. Finland has always had a restrictive uh, policy. Do you, think it, do you think it's important that you as a Finnish writer tell this story and other stories and, and how can you influence, how do you feel that you can influence the, the way Finland and, and other countries look at the refugee situation? Uh, well, F Finland, uh, <coughs> Finland's history uh, is <coughs> interesting in that way that it also reflects uh, the attitudes towards the refugees. Uh, Finland, after the wars, Finland had uh, the mission of uniting the nation. So that meant that actually we needed to be really united. Uh, and uh, that is one reason why Finland didn't start to consider itself as a country for immigration not in until 90s and uh, that's kind of in a way that mentally for Finns the idea of Finland receiving refugees is a new it's very new which is kind of strange because we did have internal refugees coming from Karelia half a million coming from there uh, we did have also Ingrian Finns who came to Finland and then they were um, transported uh, back to uh, back to the Soviet Union, so in a way, and also after the Russian Revolution, Finland was a popular transit country. So in that way, we do have a history with the immigration, we do have a history with uh, refugees as well, and half a million uh, Finns have also come to uh, Sweden. And I would like to step back to the novel with this, because one of the, one of the side stories in the novel, or one of the... Um, one of the female characters, she's migrating to Sweden. And in, in a way, I was thinking, I was reading both your article in Expressen and your novel at the same time. And I was thinking that I've, I've talked a bit to you before, but I've never really asked you about how you view Sweden from a Finnish point of view as the country where... Forgotten us. Yeah. Which was which was kind of sad. In, in then again, Estonians uh, they think Sweden has been very welcoming, even though some Estonians were uh, were um, handed uh, over to Soviet Union. But in general, uh, Estonian refugees think very warmly of of uh, Sweden and uh, the possibilities they had in Sweden. Um, they had the possibility of, of uh, having their own printing houses, own newspapers, you know, the kindergartens. It was possible to do uh, all that. And in Oslo, there was a refugee uh, government for Estonian, uh, Estonian uh, state in exile. So in that way, for Estonians, uh, Nordic countries have been very helpful. Um, but then again, when I think about, and I'm not saying that it, they wouldn't be in, uh, helpful for Finns. I mean, Finns left for Sweden for work, quite yeah. simply, because there was no work. Um, but then again, I, I think that we we talk so little of Finns who have left the country. So in a way, I don't I don't know if it's because Finns are somehow 
insulted that someone is leaving the country? <laughs> or is it that, you know, that we don't want to see ourselves as a country uh, with 